You know, before this review, I had no idea just how impactful Persona 3 was. How it laid the groundwork for future success. Literally why Persona 5 sold over 7 million copies and is the best seller in the Megami Tensei franchise. Persona 3 was the first Persona to combine the social simulation aspect with dungeon crawling. Finding yourself a lover, raising stats, deepening the connection with people around you, all while burning your bread. Persona 3 FES was my second ever Persona, Persona 4 Golden being my first, and believe it or not, despite its clear age, I enjoyed it more than 4. But that might also be because I got the bad ending in 4 and didn't restart. Also, I didn't do social links until I got Naoto. I literally missed out on half the game. But I fixed that now and I absolutely love 4. So now I wanted to go back and play my favorite. I loved 4 so much, I was afraid that it might be my new favorite Persona. Plus, with all the hype around Persona 3 Reload, I wanted to get a refresher. And boy was I refreshed. I haven't played a game like this for over a decade, and I forgot a lot. Save for major story points, I nearly forgot everything in between. It felt almost new. I had the what, but lacked the why. So, over a decade later, I'm revisiting the game that paved the way for Persona's success. But this time, with a vagina. That's right, this is my first go at Persona 3 Portable, which you could play as a girl. That is apparently different. And why shouldn't it be? Men and women experience the world differently. Oh my god, you didn't hear? Women finally got the right to be silent protagonists. Haha, <laughs> just kidding. Okay, enough jokes. Persona 3 is no laughing matter. P3P plays with depressing, dark, and heavy themes. Upon stepping off the train, just a little past midnight, the atmosphere shows just what the player is getting into. A giant yellow moon, eerie lighting, and a sea of coffins. I don't know how she does it, but apparently she ignores all the coffins and makes her way to the dorm to be greeted by this voice. You're late. I've been waiting a long time. I don't like it. In order to continue, you have to sign your soul away, agreeing that you will accept full responsibility for your actions. And the kid giggles and melts into darkness. And now you meet your roommates who have a gun. But you know, we don't worry about it. Go to school and everything's fine until the clock strikes midnight and these creatures called shadows attack. Something awakens inside you, a persona, and you're able to stand your ground. It's then you realize this dorm isn't just for any ordinary students, but members of C's, Specialized Extracurricular Execution Squad. Their goal is to take out shadows and put an end to the bizarre phenomenon known as the apathy syndrome, a disease in which people have abnormal levels of apathy. Now that they have you on their side, they now have enough people to begin exploring Tartarus, a distorted tower that your school turns into during the dark hour a magical hour that serves as a hidden 25th hour. Through the course of the school year, you'll be uncovering the secrets of Tartarus while balancing the social life of a high schooler, taking an exam, school field trips, and spending time with friends. Something Persona is known for doing well is having excellent characters. In fact, it's one of its strongest elements. Personally learning about teammates and notable NPCs. I really enjoyed the cast, starting with Yukari, and funny enough, she was among my least favorite characters the first time I played. Admittedly, it was due to her lack of being able to hit things, but this time around, I loved Yukari. She's a cheerful girl who's not afraid to dish some sass and question some of the motives of her teammates. Which brings us to Mitsuru, who was my previous favorite lady character the first time I played. She carries herself with grace and dignity and struggles to relate to others as her family and upbringing was far from ordinary. Akihiko, my boxer boyfriend, is desperate to become strong. And that's all he thinks about. Training regiments, how to better himself, and how to avoid feeling powerless. Junpei, a goofy man who loves women, but underneath that silly attitude is a sincere and thoughtful person. Junpei was my guy when I first played, and he's still my guy now. Aegis, fan favorite machine girl whose sole purpose is to defeat shadows, but along the way is learning what it means to be human. Kokomaru is a dog, but he's actually kind of adorable though. Shinji, a certified badass. Fuka, a soft-spoken, sweet girl who gets caught up in being bullied. And lastly, Ken, a 10-year-old child. 
who you can date. <laughs> Gross. But really, he's a kid working through some revenge issues. But what makes Persona 3's cast phenomenal is not only because most characters are narratively sound on their own, but also, I really love when party members have relationships with each other. It's not each person in their relationship to the MC that matters. Characters not only have independent development, but their interdependence evolves as well. The entire group as C's grows. Characters have conflicts with one another, they joke with one another. Unlike Persona 4 and 5, Persona 3's character evolutions don't revolve around the main character. They grow because they themselves solve their own problems. Obviously, you're a good friend and you're present for them, but you're not the sole trigger to their change. Persona 3's cast is so unique because not everyone is buddy-buddy. They have issues among themselves that the game gives time to fester, but also time to reflect, heal, and make amends resulting in a stronger cast. And this is so important because characters are not friends at first. They're just a group that lives in a dorm and are working together toward a common goal. This was a unique starting point, allowing additional growth for characters, characters questioning others, teasing one another, them not being buddy-buddy at the beginning makes their relationship stronger and believable. And believe me, this cast will need to work as one and harness all the strength they can muster because Persona 3 is depressing. Themes of death, mortality, how to live, and memento mori taking center stage. In Persona, we follow the lives of several teenage students and adults trying to figure out where they fit in this large world, their purpose, coming to accept the decisions they've made in this lifetime, the meaning of their limited life, the fear of living life to the fullest, since it will all end anyways. And while not heavily spoken on in game, the title screen references memento mori. Memento mori is a Latin phrase meaning remember you must die. A natural reaction to this phrase would be fear. To know the one absolute in this life is that we're all going to die. It's disheartening and may encourage people to disassociate with the joys of life since it could be gone the next day, in the next hour, in the next second. Everything we've built up, relationships, climbing corporate ladders, achieving fitness goals, academic goals, could vanish in an instant. So what's the point of pursuing it? What if I told you Memento Mori isn't meant to incite fear, rather inspire you to live life to the fullest? To keep in mind, knowing that you may not see your loved ones tomorrow, appreciating the simple pleasures of a bowl of cereal, or feel the wind at your back. To appreciate the simple things, but also go out and seize the day. Essentially, Socrates, a Greek philosopher, states, it is practicing dying for death. Practice living to the fullest, so when death inevitably sinks its bony hands into your flesh, you've burned any dread or regrets and fears, and you can move on to the next life in peace, knowing you've lived a fulfilling life. Persona 3 explores this concept through multiple characters. Some are terrified of death, cursing the idea of it, while others embrace it, wishing for it, exploring nihilism. Some of it's not about death, but the lack of enjoyment in life. Others choose to take back control of their life. Even in old age, it's never too late because they're not dead yet. All in their own way, finding their own meaning of life and to burn their fears of death and chase after a fruitful life. Persona 3 does an incredible job patiently opening the player to a plethora of characters who are tangoing with themes surrounding death or how to spend life. And in order to protect these precious characters who are searching for their place in the world, seas are scaling Tartarus, which is one of the most boring areas I've ever been. Tartarus is nothing but randomly generated floors, with a few floors being specifically designed as checkpoints and bosses. It's so uninspired, each block switching up the color palettes, changing their wall decor, and that's it. I can't help but wonder what the floor planner was thinking when they designed this place. So let me get this straight. You want me to design a tower with over 260 floors with the same tile set and each block with a different color palette? <laughs> oh, okay, five years for a bachelor's degree in engineering for this. Great. <laughs> what about him though? <laughs> what do you mean, don't worry about it? <laughs> 
All right, so before we climb, we get to select our teammates. We have a clock that heals us for a cost and a magical blue door that we'll come back to. Naturally, Tartarus is overflowing with shadows that can be hit from behind in order to gain the initiative, which I encourage because if they hit you first, you're in for a lot of hurt. Thankfully, this game isn't actually too terribly difficult. You have a four person party that you can control Yes, control. In the original, you could not control your party. I know, what kind of JRPG? It's, it's in the past now, but I'm gonna be honest, with normal battles, I had my party on auto battle and they did a decent enough job. We're gonna come back to that too. So battles, you have your standard attacks and you use your persona, which is summoned by pointing a gun at your head. Okay, it's not really a gun, it's an evoker, but we all know what this symbolizes. Facing death head on. Literally, a supporting visual to Persona's overarching theme of death. And what a cool touch that everyone handles their evokers differently, some sporting confidence while others looking less certain. It's a nice touch to show how each character confronts death. And speaking of death, shadows want you dead, landing criticals or hitting weak spots to knock you down and land a one more. The good news is, you can do it right back. Hit an enemy's weakness or land criticals and you get one more. However, Enemies don't have an all-out attack. When all enemies are down, you could do an all-out attack dealing massive damage. Enemies aren't the only thing that lurk in this tower. There are treasures and access points that automatically take you to the first floor. Because despite you going up the stairs to get to the next floor, for whatever reason, the stairs vanish behind you because magic. There are also two other types of enemies. Red ones signifying their powerful enemies, and gold enemies, which are rare monsters that give rare drops. After any battle, there's the possibility of a shuffle. This is how you gain items, extra experience, extra gold, and personas. Keep your eye on the prize and seek out whatever one you want. Stay on a floor for too long and death will seek you out. Eventually, you'll reach a boss floor that is a checkpoint which you could travel back to. But before you can proceed any further, you have to take down the Tartarus Guardian. These guys are no pushovers. Usually, they have no weaknesses if they're solo. If there are three, it's possible they could be exposed. But they hit hard and usually have an attack that can down one of your teammates. These guys are where I got my most losses. Funny enough, these guys are harder than the actual bosses who appear on a full moon. The main bosses are more gimmicky and crazy easy to down and score yourself a lot of one mores and all out attacks. Honestly, they're a joke. And the only thing that makes them unique is their design and their trick. It wouldn't be until 10 years later where they finally got the balance of gimmick and difficulty correct. You know, back when I played Persona 3 FES, I didn't find it very difficult, and playing Portable wasn't very challenging either. The thing is, Persona 3 Portable wasn't really rebalanced for being able to control your party members. Now that you can give direct commands to your teammates, you can dominate. Enemies and regular bosses honestly don't have a lot of health, but I think that's because the game would once control your party members and the AI wasn't all too great, so it allowed for some grace if your teammates didn't control well. Another way they weren't updated in the original Persona 3 is how multi-target attacks work. If you use a multi-target attack and hit all enemies, you down all of them and you get one more. But if you miss one enemy despite downing one or even the majority, you are denied one more. Essentially, it's safer to hit each enemy one by one to ensure one more. Naturally, this consumed an unnecessary amount of MP and wasting my time watching my team make beta moves. Thankfully, in newer Persona games, you knock one thing down, you're owed one more. Still, this was by far my biggest frustration with my teammates. That and Mitsuru who's notorious for using Marin Karen, a charm spell with a low chance of success, on an enemy instead of freaking attacking. This is what I get for playing lazy and grinding with my characters set on Act Brain Dead. There are fusion spells which have been slightly reworked. In the original or FES, you needed both personas in your party, and the spell would be under skills. In portable, they're a consumable item, which prevents spamming since you can only have a limited number, and they're a pain in the ass to grind for. But I gotta be honest with you guys, I didn't use a single fusion spell during my playthrough because I never needed to. The game was just that easy. Other fun facts, the Protag has a set weapon now, whereas in FES, they could use any weapon. I'm fine with the MC being relegated to having one weapon, considering we have direct control over party members now. 
Plus, MC is the only one with multiple personas, meaning she can switch to a persona with a specific attack type, slash, pierce, or strike. Your allies have a single persona, usually specializing in a single element. And speaking of personas, this brings us back to floor 1 of Tartarus. This blue door right here. Walk inside and who do we see? This fine-ass attendant giving us Britney Spears toxic. Hello, sir. Yes, in P3P you get the option of Elizabeth, which, don't get me wrong, best Velvet Room attendant in the entire series, but Theodore? Hello, sir. How are you doing today? Ooh, how can you help me? You can help me pop this p Poor Igor, he doesn't get paid enough for this shit. So what to do here, what to do here. The function you'll be using the most here is fusion. Fusing two personas to make a new one. Of course, you can never fuse higher than your current level. So not only do you get a brand new persona, but it randomly inherits moves from the personas you're fusing. Keyword here being random. Yes, you can't choose what moves it takes, which is annoying considering this feature wasn't adjusted into this port. So you have to do a lot of rerolls, essentially switching the order of who you want to fuse. So fusing A plus B will always get you C, but with moves one, two, three. But if you fuse B plus A, you'll still get C, but with moves four, five, six. Then you could go back to A plus B and you could be given moves one, two, five. And you get the point. I wish I could choose my moves, but considering how they did nothing to balance enemies, you're able to give your party direct commands, and if you were able to select what moves your personas got, would make this game an absolute cakewalk. And later, you'll be able to fuse three or more special fusions. Special fusions are where most of the endgame personas come from, sporting a lot of strengths and minimal weaknesses. And you want to know what my issue is? Later SMT and Persona spoiled me on this, but as long as you fuse the Persona before, you can get it back for a price. So these higher end Personas, let's say you fused all the requirements before. Well in later SMT games, as long as you have the coin, you are able to fuse the higher end Persona, with the game assuming you bought the fusion fodder. In Persona 3, you must buy them separately, have them in your stock, then fuse them. It's just the convenience I miss. But the compendium. Traditional in any SMT or SMT spinoff, you can register your personas there and buy them back for a hefty fee. Persona 3 is stupid good about money. By the end game, you'll be filthy rich, and I was never hurting for moolah. Theodore will also give you quests, usually to collect a specific item drop or find an item outside of Tartarus. And some of these quests have time limits. When it comes to requesting a specific item, you usually get it from a party member, but the kicker is you can only get that item on a certain day. Meaning, if you miss that day, you're locked out from completing that quest. And this is why I used every save slot in Persona 3. And I still ended up messing up. Upon completion of these quests, you're able to fuse unique Persona or items. Although the best quest Theodore has to offer is going on a date with him! Yes, you get to take him to school, to shrines, and eventually your bedroom where things get a little steamy. Ooh, girl. But an unofficial quest you'll have to keep an eye out for are people getting lost in Tartarus. This is the game's way of making you go back to Tartarus even though you've climbed as high as you possibly could for that time. People in Tartarus must be rescued before the next full moon, otherwise they die. Thankfully, your navigator will let you know if a person is on that floor. You can rescue them, which will automatically take you back to floor 1. Actually, a semi-useful feature for exploring and searching for these guys is to split up. Pretty much the team breaks up if their icon darkens, they're too far away to assist you, or for you to heal them. You could set them up to explore, meaning to avoid shadows, or seek out and destroy them all. Exploring is great for just that, you're just trying to find a lost person or the access point or the stairs. And what's really nice is if the stairs or access point is found, you can automatically use it. But if an ally's in combat and you choose to ascend, you leave them behind. Now if they're set to explore only and they're caught by shadows, allies won't come in to help them, they'll just run past. And frankly, the AI is lame, and those in combat don't use any SP except to heal themselves. So essentially, they're only doing physical damage. This would prove fatal if the enemy was immune to their attacks, or if the enemy is weak to their element. It wouldn't matter because they wouldn't use their SP. So these fights took forever. Now, if you have split up and target all enemies, cool, allies would help each other out, still without using SP. That is assuming they're smart enough to enter the battle. 
Sometimes allies would just get stuck against combating teammates and would never actually engage in battle, just run. So why split up to fight solo? Well, more experience. You don't have to share among the party. Yes, teammates can also level up while fighting too, but I hardly found it super beneficial for them because they don't get shuffle times, meaning ways to increase the experience points. Honestly, I think splitting in parties of two is the way. That way I can always have one character with me to level up. And I think with some AI intelligence upgrades and more customization, I think splitting up could prove to be more useful. To the point of saving people, for each soul saved, you get an item from the police as a thank you and job well done. But if you're not a good Samaritan and some prize items and money isn't enough, maybe knowing some of these lost lambs are people you can create social links with. And if you fail to come to their aid, their link is broken, meaning their social link ends there. But wait, 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 what? are social links. This is the entire other half, the social aspect of Persona. It plays a huge role in powering up your personas. You will encounter several other unique people while you balance your school life with taking down shadows. Some of these people are in C's while others are just normal high school students or characters outside of school life. Each character represents an arcana. Every persona corresponds to an arcana. Each time you hang out with someone, you're taken through their personal journey like helping a little girl navigate her way through her parents' divorce, characters who deal with loss of a friend or family, and my personal favorite, my boy Akinari. Between him and Aegis, I think got the most emotions out of me. And I don't want to spoil his arc, but no, it's 100% worth doing. His was the one I really sat down and soaked in his words, his feelings, and put myself in his shoes that brought a tear or two to my eyes. But. With how these interactions work is typically after school you have a chance to hang out with someone. Different characters are available on different days. And some characters have different requirements to even begin a social link. Typically depending on your social stats, charm, academics, and courage. Different facilities hone different social stats. When you choose to hang out with someone, they begin to open up to you, sometimes prompting you to answer questions. Answer correctly and you score points with them you'll need a certain amount of points to be able to progress to the next social link story beat. Otherwise, you'll have a generic hangout session with them that won't progress their story, but will award you social points for that character. One of the ways to avoid generic hangouts is by bringing a persona that corresponds with their arcana with you, automatically granting you an extra point. So hanging out with Junpei with a mage persona on hand will give you plus one. So you could earn 3 points instead of 2, or 2 instead of 1. Now, to score the most part the first time playing is nigh impossible, so that's why I use the guide to speed things along. But I would always recommend to not use a guide your first time through to have a unique and authentic experience. But this is my second time playing Persona 3, granted as a lady. Which did make it different, but also, most of us here are grown ass adults who don't have time to replay an 80 hour RPG just for social links. So. There's that. Fun fact, playing with a vagina changed a few things. One being we got brand new social links exclusive to FemMC. The biggest thing is you can form bonds with both female and male teammates. Yes, male MC cannot form any bonds with male C's members, not even Kokomaru. But really, fellas, is it gay to have social links with the homies? Yes. <laughs> Whether you play FES or Portable, the male MC never forms bonds with male C's members. For example, the star in the male route is the rival athlete, Mamoru. In Fem MC, it's Akihiko. The moon is Nozomi for male, but Fem MC, it's Shinji. Strength for the male MC is Hyuko but Fem MC, it's Kokomaru. So Fem MC gets a plethora of new social links to explore. This alone is worth another playthrough of Persona 3, just for the differences in bonds. Not only that, but Fem MC seems to have more cheerful and uplifting dialogue options, rather than her male counterpart who is rather flat. Now, this is kind of a dating sim, so in the original Persona 3, the male MC was forced to be sort of a pimp. For most female social links he maxes out, he becomes intimate with automatically. And female social links could reverse or even break if you went too long without seeing them. However, Portable got rid of that mechanic entirely. As for Lady MC, you have the option to pursue platonic relationships. Thank goodness. Though pursuing either a romantic or platonic relationship can be tricky in Persona 3 Portable because the options aren't always crystal clear. Thankfully for Ken, they are, so no excuses. 
But they took a page out of Persona 4's book allowing you to not whore yourself out. Or be like me and do. There is not a penalty for being a hoe. Persona 3's male cast is pretty awesome. But aside from romancing the cast, what do social links really do? Persona in general is really good at having story and gameplay elements and weaving them together. Again, each social link corresponds to an arcana. When you fuse demons and make that demon that matches the arcana with the developed social link, you'll get a social link bonus. Meaning they'll gain extra experience and level up upon them being fused. This is great because you blast through levels, and the demons are learning skills you'd otherwise have to grind for. The higher the social link, the more experience. Hell, sometimes their skills will prompt a change into something better, or worse. And more importantly, some personas will have a heart, meaning once they learn all their skills, the persona will attempt to make something, a useful accessory. These items you cannot buy, so sometimes it may be worth investing in. Another reason to invest in social links are those that are maxed out and can unlock a special persona, essentially the most powerful of that particular arcana. And you know how I mentioned persona is good about melding story and gameplay? While the MC can switch personas, their first one is Orpheus, and the main cast have set personas. Fuka has Lucia, Akihiko has Polydeuces, Ken has Nemesis, etc. I'm not going to go through them all, but knowing the mythology behind each persona often corresponds with their wielder in some degree. So for example, let's take Fuka or Lucia or Saint Lucy, essentially a Christian noblewoman who had an arranged marriage with a wealthy pagan man. However, being a martyr, Lucy had consecrated her virginity to God and wanted to gift her dowry among the poor. She did so, and the news reached her betrothed's ear. He wasn't happy and told the governor during a time Christians were persecuted under the reign of the Roman Emperor Diocletian. They threw her in a brothel to be defiled, but she could not be moved. She was sentenced to death by fire, but she was impervious to flames. And depending on who you hear it from, she either gouged her own eyes out or the governor ordered them to be taken. And finally, her death ended with a sword to the throat. Saint Lucy is often depicted holding a golden plate with a pair of eyes, and is the patron saint of the blind. Now you're wondering, why does this matter? While Fuka's character doesn't necessarily follow Saint Lucy's story, she is the group's navigator through the depths of Tartarus, letting you know when someone's on a floor, how many floors till the next boss, senses other Persona users. Without her, you would essentially be navigating Tartarus blind, but who better than to lead the blind than the patron saint herself? More importantly, this is reflected in Fuka's persona's design. The top part of her head bandaged up and so is her neck. These little mythological nuggets are carefully and purposely sprinkled into Persona 3's story. If you look into other Persona's users and their relation to other Personas, it can be quite telling. The visual resolution upgrade between 2023 remaster of P3P and the original and FES is outstanding. I'm not an FPS junkie, but the glow up is quite noticeable. Persona 3 Portable being 1080p and 60fps, before it certainly had a blur to it. Character art was comparatively fuzzy, background seemed smudged, and the text wasn't as crisp. The remaster sharpens it all. Character portraits are crystal clear, backgrounds are cleaned up, text looks a lot more defined. It undeniably looks better. Another massive change that I'm not entirely too mad about is how you move outside of Tartarus. In the original, you move the MC like any other game. You'd approach NPCs to talk to, interact with vendors. Now it's a point and click game, which at first took me back, but it actually turned out to be quite the time saver. On the outside, Persona isn't exactly an exploration game. It's after every story beat, you go to the same places to talk, usually the same people, but with different dialogue. Being a point and click hybrid just makes it easier. Instead of wasting time walking around, I just point to a person and they say what they're gonna say. Same with interacting with shops. I admit it's visually less interesting seeing a room versus seeing yourself in a room. Rooms are usually from a first person view, while venues, classrooms, halls are seen from a bird's eye view. And I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I found it hard to see what was interactable, so they have this nifty symbol feature. I wish I discovered this sooner because I didn't know you could save at a desk until late fourth quarter. This also saves time by fast traveling. In the original, there was no fast traveling. In FES, there was a specific character you had to talk to, but in Portable, they just incorporated fast travel with the click of a button. Again, Persona 3's focus isn't on exploration, so it just made it quick and easy for me to move around so I could talk to NPCs and get the flavor text. I actually love this way of playing. I do wish the interactable characters looked a little better though. They look like cheap plastic figures that only move when you look away. <gasps> they moved. 
Toy Story's real. But when you enter Tartarus, then you're free to move around as you would normally. And this works because you actually explore Tartarus, even if there are minimal things to discover. One of the biggest losses of Persona 3 Portable is the lack of animated cutscenes. They took it out entirely. At most, we get dynamic-ish images and text describing the atmosphere. And it's just so sad to read what was an originally perfectly cut, juxtaposed story of the MC heading to the train station, taking his time, minding his business, Japan is hustling and bustling as usual while Yukari is struggling to pull the trigger. It was a tone setter, the player couldn't look away. And with the music fading in and out, accentuating Yukari's dread, the bright yellows and oranges, colors of happiness and warmth while someone's holding a gun to their head, it was a beautiful two minute work of art. And remember that scene I described in the beginning when you meet a creepy boy? That was originally animated. And obviously it was much creepier. Opening the door to the dorm to see a camera pan from two different angles showing nobody's there. There, until we get a close-up and there he is. Note, he's behind the counter and at the snap of his fingers, he's in front of you, motioning you to sign a contract that magically opens. You sign your name, he makes the contract vanish and melts into darkness. And it shows the MC standing alone. These little vanishing acts add to his mystique, something that is lost and portable. Then Yukari comes in, sweating, trembling with fear as she tries to reach for her gun. Even now she says, who's there? Sounds more fearful and urgent versus the Yukari in Portable who seems to be asking with more demand than fear. Who's there? Who's there? And considering what little we know of Yukari at this point, she should sound more fearful than demanding. This is a girl who couldn't pull the trigger, and moments later, when in the face of danger, still couldn't evoke her persona. And when Yukari does draw her gun, Queen Mitsuru arrives, and the main theme kicks in, and it's just so good. And to have it reduced to a character popping up on screen like the rest of the game, it loses so much punch and potency. And these are just the first animated cutscenes of the game. And yeah, I know, they tried to emulate the spookiness of Persona 3 FES, but this? You gotta be kidding me! We'll never hold a candle to this. FES gets the shadow crawling toward the heroes, and Portable gets a black swipe transition. Because Portable took a visual novel approach, actions are read out or told through sound effects. We can no longer see the group in action like the original or FES. And it's so damn sad because I think some of the scenes should have visually been fleshed out, like Agus's iconic intro and her meeting the protagonist for the first time. It was sad to read what was happening rather than show it. Persona 3 Portable Femme MC changed a lot of things. Dialogue options, social links, maneuvering through the game, choice of Velvet Room Attendant, and the music. Firstly, Persona just doesn't believe in bad music. I may have only played 3 through 5, but Persona only serves bangers. Where do I even begin? I suppose a good place to start is noting every Persona game's original soundtrack is written with a musical genre in mind. Hip hop, rap, and rock are the obvious standouts in Persona 3, and throw in a dash of J-pop. The first thing you hear in the strums of an electric guitar, quickly accompanied by the drums, setting a hardcore badass tone but then turn somber for the lyrics to kick in and give the song a melancholy moment that reverts into something hopeful and fighting for your life. Same with the text seen within the song actually supports Persona 3's theme, life and what you do with it. Here we have a quote from the famous German philosopher, this guy, he who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. Meaning, people who have a strong sense of purpose or reason for living can face any challenge. That is quite literally what our cast is going through, struggling why to keep going. When life gets tough, it's easy to throw in the towel. But those who want to live give themselves purpose, no matter how big or small, and keep up a good fight. Memento Mori, Remember You Must Die, is also hidden in the opening. Living isn't about breathing, but doing. Another mention of simply existing isn't living, but going and doing something with your life is. 
This whole opening is riddled with what life is, what life should be, quotes and descriptions of life. But because Persona 3 has three versions, and of course a fourth coming in 2024, naturally there are three different openings. And I just want to briefly talk about them. The original, the classic, Burn My Dread. I think this song starts off more peppy, then it breaks into rock. Themes of Memento Mori and reminders that you are still mortal remain. Both P3P and the original are pretty minimalistic looking, the original even more so, but I still prefer it more. I love the music more as well. FES, which is the one I originally played and is by far my favorite. Utilizing in-game cutscenes and animated cutscenes, but absolutely removes all text, and the song is far too upbeat for what the game actually is. We get a mellow beginning, then it gets loud and proud. doesn't have an official name, but I would refer to it as Burn My Dread Remix, as it has components of Kimi no Kyoku and Burn My Dread, the ending and opening themes of Persona 3. It's quirky jazz pop? It's sung by Yumi Kawamura, and the rap vocals are Lotus Juice. And of course, Persona 3 Portable's opening called Soul Phrase, which is a slowed down remix of FemMC's regular and boss battle themes. Visuals are minimalistic and frankly underwhelming. We got the text, we have the cast looking like edgelords, and of course, it incorporates the newest edition, FemMC. <laughs> Out of the three openings, Portable is my least favorite, FES being my favorite and the original being in the middle, but the opening is far from the only musical change. Several songs were replaced with different ones, like After School, Looking for Shit to Do, I loved the male MC, When the Moon's Reaching Stars. It's fast paced but still smooth and just a great song to enjoy while wandering around. Remember the past games didn't have a good fast travel, so this helped exploration outside of Tartarus be bearable. But then we have the Fem MC's overworld theme, if you would, A Way of Life. And you know what? I'm a fan. It's very relaxing. I like to take my time to stop and smell the roses, enjoying the way of your new school life. It's upbeat and mellow. And at the same time, I think it's suitable for Fem MC, who seems to have a more jovial personality. When the semester or seasons change in Persona, sometimes the theme changes with it. So I got some opinions here. The song called Changing Seasons You're hit with these drawn out lyrics, then it hits with the instrumental and the smooth jazz just pops off. It is my favorite hands down, so you can imagine I wasn't very happy when it was replaced with Fem MC's son. And damn it, this song goes hard. I like it. I remember first hearing it and I was like, yo, this is amazing. But I loved Changing Seasons. So while it is an acceptable rival for Changing Seasons, I'm still a little mad about it. Battle themes were also changed. In the mail route, we're hit with an explosive sound accompanied by deep and heartfelt lyrics. <clears throat> it reads, baby, 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 baby. Oh yeah. Yeah. 
happy. It's honestly an incredible song. The rap flows well. I love, again, the remix of rap and rock, and the chorus feels so hype. And you have to remember, one of the key things about a battle theme is the player will hear these the most, specifically the beginning. And the opening is iconic. Fem MC, Wipe It All Out, is also really good. Still keeps the rap rock vibe. I think the feminine lyrics are more prevalent and still hard hitting. Rectangles just like music, Sam's connect and ramble. Both of these songs are great for interrupting the drab music of Tartarus. Okay, that's not entirely true, but Tartarus is a very unique case. Each block of Tartarus builds upon itself, increasing the sense of doom for what lies in wait at the very top. First, it's very minimal, like venturing into the unknown, and it's more about figuring out what the hell is going on. Then, more sound is added, and it sounds slightly fuller, giving the piece more body, and in a way, the player more confidence, like, okay, I completed block one, maybe I could see what's good with block two. And you think it's gonna add on, get louder as you grow more bold to scale a warped structure named after a divine Greek prison, but it doesn't always. And I think that's a good thing to keep you on your toes. Tartarus is hands down one of the most boring dungeons I've ever had the displeasure of scaling. But if they did one thing right, it was the music and the buildup. Tartarus is a prime example of how music can make a world of difference and set a tone. At the end of the day, at its core, each block of Tartarus is the same. Random floors, bosses, enemies, treasures, find the stairs, repeat. But what the music does is warp the player's mind to enter Tartarus with a new mindset, a new feeling. You can't tell me that entering Tartarus hearing this gives you the same feeling as entering Tartarus and hearing this. Two different types of energies. Now, I'm not suggesting this was enough to make Tartarus fun to explore, but it did help reinvigorate my desire to press onward. If I had to pick my favorite song, limited to the Fem MC, I'd say it goes to Sun, the song that rivals my favorite song in the male MC route. It's no secret that I parade the fact that Persona 3 is my favorite Persona out of the ones I played. And I was certain that it could not be pushed from its pedestal, but... Hear me out, I think I like Persona 4 a little bit more, just a tiny bit more. That being said, I think Persona 4 just flew by for me because it was genuinely a fun adventure with my now, I think, favorite cast of all time. Sorry, Nier. But by no means do I think Persona 3 is lesser, I just think my genuine enjoyment was greater in 4, where 3 made me have to ironically confront some aspects of how I live my life. Ironic, because that's exactly what happens in Persona 4, but in this case, you're confronting death. Persona 3 was more thought-provoking and did a great job showing and not telling what its theme is. Not death, but how you live life. And to support these ideas is a cast each struggling in finding meaning and purpose within their own lives, dealing with loss in many of its forms and how they come out better for it, channeling grief into strength, and whatever ails them too shall pass. Or maybe it's not about getting over something, but how to live with something. Persona 3 explores so many angles of life and existentialism that it had my head spinning. Persona 3 is a game that held a mirror up to me and made me think how I've been spending my life. And a lot of my time has been studying Japanese, drawing, gaming, and I'm personally trying to shift around some of those aspects of my life. While I love experiencing stories through gaming, I think I let my own life slip away a little and I've been trying to reconnect with some friends and Live like I could die at any damn minute. And now Persona 3 Reload is right around the corner. And I wanted to play the older versions before playing the new one so I can have a better idea of what was new, changed, and maybe make more of a differences video than a full on review. 
I don't imagine the story changing. Frankly, if it did, I'd be mad because Persona 3's story is one of my favorites that I encourage everyone to experience. And if you're like me and you haven't played it over a decade, re-experience it. Because playing with the vagina actually felt like a completely new game, coupled with not remembering events in between big moments. Persona overall is an excellent series, and I've covered 4 Golden and Persona 5 Vanilla on this channel, which you should totally check out. Especially my Persona 4 Golden video, I worked very hard on that one. And if you like what I do, be sure to check out my Patreon, support the channel by pledging, and get cool benefits like early access to videos, voting on video topics, and postcards. Love your faces, and I'll see you in the next video. Mwah!